Just a few days ago, I watched a video on Jeremy's channel, and it just broke my heart to hear his story, what he went through, and what he actually did later on when he found the culprit. And to just go to that house door, and you know, anything could happen, police are on the way. Man, my heart was going like crazy. So thanks for coming on, Jeremy. Do you want to just tell people who you are, why you've got a channel, what you're about, and then we can get to your story? Yeah, that's great. Um, so um, my name's Jeremy Gunatilica, and I am currently sharing my story of child sexual abuse in the attempt to really help contribute to breaking down the stigma and the silence that is really allowing it to thrive behind closed doors. And that's why I created a channel to, to upload the content that I'm creating and, and let people view it. For readers to understand then what led to you knocking on that door, mm. are you okay to tell them the events that led up to that? How, how are this yeah. all started? Yeah, absolutely. That's no problem at all. So I really started to think about the abuse that I went through as a child when I was 24 years old. And the abuse must have happened when I was around eight, eight or nine, I think. So, you know, that was uh, many, many years after I really started thinking about it. Like the, the memories were coming on strong and I tried to push them away for many years, but, but I couldn't. I, one second, one second. Yeah. How, did, how did this person have access to you at eight okay, or nine yes. years old? Um, he was a babysitter while my parents were at work. Oh. And he was a trusted family friend who was known to the family and, and was, was happy to help out. Um, did you have siblings at the time? I did, a sister, older sister. Did anything happen there? And I've spoken with her and she has told me that thankfully, luckily, nothing happened to her. It was always a big... As I was dealing with the memories, one of the biggest fears for me was it had happened to her as well. So thankfully, um, no, it has not. So it was, it was me that was targeted and um, manipulated. You said that it exploded in your head when you were mm. in your 20s. Had it been nagging away at you over the years or had you buried it? You know what, it's such an interesting com uh, question because when I look back at it now, up until I was 24, I never, it was never a pressing thing on my mind. It was never disturbing me. However, it wasn't something I was thinking about regularly. However, there were things that would really remind me of what happened. Uh, things such as when people would talk about homosexuality, m man engaging, men engaging with men, it would trigger the memories. When, um, a very interesting one actually, I didn't realize I was doing it, but now I, I see the pattern. When me and my friends would go away and stay in hotels, I would never share the bed. I would always sleep on the floor because I couldn't get close to another male. And, and it was just a thing that I did and it was accepted as, oh, Jez just doesn't like sharing the bed, he just sleeps on the floor. And that was actually me not wanting to, to get close to another male. And also when I watched the film Sleepers, which is about um, children who were abused in authorities, when I saw that, it really hit me. So there were things in my life that were highlighting what had happened. So I'd never forgotten. I'd just buried it. Just to go back a bit, you said it happened when you were approximately nine. Yes. Over what period of time did it happen? Was it once? Was it multiple times? So I am, um, it was definitely multiple times the length of time that it went on for i am not sure but i'm going to assume approximately something like a year and the reason why i say that is because i was very familiar with our routines and i knew exactly what he liked what he didn't like his go-to moves um you know the different places where it would happen and um, I was very familiar with what we were doing. I, under, I, 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 I knew our routines and I knew what he liked and, and what he preferred to do. So it must have gone on for a, a long period of time. Now, as a nine-year-old kid, 
Are you comprehending that he's taking advantage of you? How are you, like, rationalizing what he's doing at this point? If you if you can remember that, yes. that's got to be pretty hard. Yes. So it's really very interesting when we look back at how this occurred and how this happened. He was very. It wasn't scaring me at the time. It was something that just me and him did together. It was just something, a game that me and him played and I didn't play with anybody else. So there was no reason for me to question it. It wasn't scaring me. It wasn't hurting me. So there was no alarm bells in my head. And, and we must remember that when I was eight slash nine around that time, it was 1993. So there was no, nobody was talking to somebody of my age about abusive relationships, what abuse is, what sex is. There was no internet, so I wouldn't have ever come across it. So I didn't know that what I was doing was wrong. It was just a thing that I did with him and I, I knew that we weren't to tell anybody. How did you know that? Did he say things to you like you can't tell anybody about this? So I don't remember him directly saying it, but he must have implemented it in a way. He must have. Um, you know, I was very close to my sister, for example. I was, I had a really great set of friends at that time that I'm thankfully still friends with now. So I had a close bond with other uh, children in the school. So I never mentioned it to anybody. So he must have instilled it in me somehow. So as you became a teenager then, and you, I'm assuming you had sex with somebody at some point, how did that... Did that trigger anything? So no, it really didn't, you know, and and um, I never really, even, even at, in my college years and as I was growing into a young adult and having relationships with, with, other, with um, other girls, women, I never, nothing ever triggered me to think back to that. So it, it just wasn't really causing me any discomfort in those years. What do you think the catalyst was for it to explode in your 20s? Yeah, wow. It's, it's a question I'm always thinking about. And, you know, I think maybe... I think maybe um, I, I, I had become of a maturity or a, an age um, where I was ready to look at it, possibly. But also, very interestingly, I was actually working in Abu Dhabi at the time. And I, I, there's something, a suspicion in my head that I think I had seen somebody who looked like him. He was of Asian, um, South, Southeast Asian colour. And um, I just think I've seen somebody because I remember going back to the hotel room that I was staying at. And that is one of my very significant memories of, of when this all started. And I think maybe I'd, something, I'd seen somebody who looked like him and it had triggered it. But that, that with a combination of, of my age and, and maturity to, to deal with it. So if you have buried this for over a decade and now it's triggered, what kind of emotional turmoil is going through your brain? Can you sleep? Are you, are you just focused on this now all the time? Well, it was a very unusual challenging time when these memories started coming in because when they first came in i remember thinking something feels wrong something doesn't feel right i feel really uncomfortable within myself and didn't put it on the abuse and then as the months went on i was like oh my goodness it's that no it's not no it's not i told myself no 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 don't worry about it it's not that and then it would come back oh my god it really is that and I, I tried for three years to ignore it. Um, I, tried, I kept pushing it away. Don't worry about it. It hasn't worried you all of this time. And I, I thought, yeah, it's okay. I can just ignore it and, and we can continue. You know, I was 24 when, when the memories started coming in. So young man, enjoying his life, great friends, partying, good career. And um, I was like, oh, we don't need this. I tried for three years, but they just kept coming back stronger. And that's when I told somebody for the first time at 27. So in neuroscience, they say that memory can be malleable. How certain were you that you weren't just thinking these yes. things and it actually hadn't happened? Yeah, it's, it's, I think every survivor 
um, goes through this thought process of um, because I am, me and him are the only people who know about this, the truth. Yeah, and, and I was so young. There is definitely um, every now and again you think, oh, it could, you could just be making it up. But, but that's, a, that's a, not the devil on my shoulder, but I, I don't know how to explain it. That's just a, a, a reaction mechanism, I think. Um, I did go through that process, as you mentioned. And, and of course, then the memories, as I allowed myself to think about it, the memories grew stronger and I remembered more and more and more. And, and, and now I can detail much of it. So. so you told somebody at what age? 27. So three years later from the initial memories. And what motivated you to tell somebody? You know what? I was, by that by that time, I was, it was a strong thing in my head and, and it was a drunken night. We were out partying and it was a, it was a very, very good friend of mine. In fact, it was a friend of mine that I'd had a couple of years before the abuse was going on. So we'd known each other 25 years and, and um, we were sitting down. I'll never forget it. And it just, it just came out. I just said to him, mate, you're never going, going to believe what happened to me when I was young. And, and I told him and um, wow, what an incredible feeling it was when I did that, really. So you said he was your friend for 25 years. Yeah. So he was your friend when this it was all going so on. Yeah. Did he notice anything, any change yeah. in you at the time? He was, I will never forget his face because it was just genuine shock 100 percent. you know we've been through our our years of being a child where you've still got like a teddy bear you know and and then a young man and then teenage years and adult years and and of course he he didn't have a clue so it was a great shock to him and did he know the guy no he did not know that he never met him did you tell somebody else after this so once I told him when I woke up the next morning, the feeling that I had was of, I felt great. It felt like a weight off my shoulders. And I remember telling him that. I felt a, a sense of reward, confidence, victory almost. It felt, I, I got good feelings from it. So uh, possibly once I told him, I thought, right, that's, that's great. It's dealt with. One year later, I tell somebody else it was not dealt with. One year later, I tell another friend. And this goes on for the next six years. I tell maybe seven, eight people. Um, and I must add, for anybody that's listening, um, my heart goes out to you if you do not have people close to you to tell. I'm very fortunate that I had um, these people that were close to me to tell. That made things a lot easier. So yes, over the, over the next six years, until I was 32, 33, I had told six or seven people, each time growing in confidence, each time growing in strength about what had happened. And did you tell anyone outside of your friends, a therapist, or did you file a police complaint? So I hadn't spoke to a therapist about it. I didn't see if there was any, I didn't see that there was any need to at that time. Um, I just told it was really great to let my close friends know, my group of friends. And that felt important to me and, and it was great. Now, after I had told those friends, I got really curious about what's going on out there. You know, what's actually happening with this whole situation? So I started Googling things like um, child sexual abuse. What happens to the brain if you've been abused? Um, abuse recovery, et cetera, et cetera. And I came across some chat rooms that I started to engage in and I started to understand the magnitude of what's going on. And it really hit me. It really hit me. Now I researched for maybe six months and then I started speaking publicly about my story because I thought to myself, I should share my story. And I started doing that at open mic nights in London. So that was a good platform. You get five minutes on stage and um, I started just telling parts of my story. Now, in doing this, what really was 
a question in my head that I couldn't now get rid of was, is he still doing it? And I thought to myself, when I thought that question, which was a very uncomfortable question to have in my head, I thought, it's none of your business. And to try to find out whether he's still doing it is a complex road to go down. So I ignored that question, but much like the memories back when I was 24, I couldn't get rid of that question. And um, uh, that's when I thought I should try to seek him, to, to try to find him. So I looked online for him and couldn't find him anywhere. I tried everything, social media, of course, and, and, and every other search you could, you could type into Google uh, because I knew his name. And I couldn't find him anywhere. There was, there was not a trace, but I managed to find his wife's Facebook profile and he was in her pictures. Now, when I saw him for the first time for 25 years, it was a feeling of, for, I don't think there are any words that can describe what it felt like to see his face, but it, he hadn't changed in my eyes. And um, I messaged her and I messaged her a general message at the start and then she was not very responsive. So I messaged her letting her know what he had done to me when I was a child. And I said, look, you have 24 hours to, con to get him to contact me, otherwise I'm gonna have to go to the police. Please cooperate. Uh, because initially my thought was I should meet him. That was my initial thought. Um, probably in error now I look back at it, but anyway, uh, we learn as we're going, right? And um, she messaged back, uh, she didn't message me back and two hours later she blocked me. So I went to the police and I reported it. And so that's how we get to me reporting it. Would you like me to continue talking about? Yeah, how receptive were the police? Now, the police were great. The police were great for me. Uh, they, I would have liked things to have been investigated at a quicker rate. I would have liked to have a response to my email on the day that I sent it. But what I was told and what I think is true is they have more cases than police to deal with. They're inundated with reports to investigate. So I was asked, please be patient with us. We are overrun. And so I was patient with them. Um, so I was, I was okay with the, with the procedure. Uh, but of course we would like things to be we would like the funding to be increased so that they could it could be improved what is the procedure if you report something so many years later do they yeah. just take a statement so they initially uh, took a brief statement over the phone and then they asked me for i had to go into the station for to for the interview and the interview lasts 4 4 hours and it was the first time the only time I have ever detailed the abuse in explicit terms. So that was very, very difficult actually to do. It makes it feel really real. And actually it makes me feel sad for the boy that I was. That's, that's really what it is. When I look back at that small, young, innocent boy that I was to explain what happened explicitly, I feel very sad for that boy because that boy was innocent and didn't deserve anything. So it was uh, quite an ordeal to give the statement. Uh, what, what went on after that was they went to interview some people who I had told. I gave them the list of the names of the people that I had told. And then they interviewed, they, they uh, notified me that they were going to interview him. So the criticism for the system that I have in this area not the police, because they're just working to the system. The, the, the criticism I have with the system is he was under voluntary arrest, meaning he was told there was, an, uh, there was an accusation and he was allowed to go to the station himself. Now, for me personally, that was an error of the system. They should have gone to his house and arrested him and seized his computer at the least because we don't know what was on there. 
it should have been enough that I named him. It was proven that he babysitted me. It was proven that he was at our house. And I had told 10 people, it's not something that you make up. That should have been enough. It's very important that we were to have got his computer just in case there was something on there. But that wasn't done. So that is my criticism of the computer, oh, of the system. Yeah, it's complicated because there's a presumption of innocence until you're convicted Absolutely. and you've got to get warrants to snatch people's computers and, and raid houses and things like that. So how long was all this ongoing with the police then? So the investigation lasted one year and then it was closed. Um, it couldn't be taken to court because there was a lack of evidence. So you need to have, uh, I was, I was informed you need to have a certain level of evidence to to take something to court to, to to allow it to stand any chance of success and because mine happened in the 90 early 90s there actually is no evidence um the only evidence we have is we know he was at his our house for sure because there's a photograph he is known to the family for sure there are people that are saying that and that's it so what year was that conclusion announced and did you see him at all at this point or you still had no contact with him? So I still had no contact with him at this point and the case was closed in June 2019. I appealed it and the appeal was rejected um, two months later. So we're looking at September 2019. All right, so you feel that the justice system had let you down at that point, understandably, and now something has motivated you to go and confront him. And what's going through your head at that point? When the case, when I received the phone call for the case being closed, it was like my heart fell out of, of me, you know? It was like, well, I felt angry because I felt silenced. I felt frustrated because I'm telling the truth. How I felt like, okay, I understand we haven't got enough evidence, but we should take him to court because no doubt when we're all standing there, it's possible he crumbles. It was all of these things going on in my head. But the question of, is he still doing it, wasn't satisfied. And I was a bit angry that he had denied what he did. And now he goes back to his family and they play happy families and it's all forgotten about and, and I was not okay with that. I was not okay with that. So you wanted him to have some kind of consequence for his actions. Take us to the moment that you're psyched up and you're about to do it. Yeah, so I thought a lot about finding where he is. And I spent some more time on the internet and had some rough places of possibly where he lives, etc. And I managed to nail it down to his house. And when I did that, I thought to myself, this is really it. This is the moment. And you know what? I didn't think about what could happen, what could go wrong, what could go right the importance of confronting him to make him face me was overpowering and and it was kind of give me tunnel vision and and yes i went up to the door i knocked the porch light came on and somebody was answering the door and, before this though yeah you've, you've identified the house yes had you gone up and done like a reconnaissance of the house beforehand or anything Yes, so I went up to the house. I knew it was their house. I actually took a photo of the number plate and the, that, the street name because I thought I will come back another day. Um, but it had to be then. It just had to be then. The lights were on. The car was on the drive. And I just thought you should do it now. Did you know what you hoped to achieve or was your heart just telling you this has got to be done? My heart was telling me that it's got to be done. There was no agenda. There was no list of things to do or say. There was no, if he does this, make sure you do this. It was just knock on the door. 
All right, so you knock on the door, and then what happened? So when I knocked on the door, and somebody came to unlock it the other side, and he opened it, and the minute our eyes caught each other, he recognised me instantly. And he went to he, he went to slam the door shut straight away, but some miracle, I managed to hold it open at the last minute and get my foot in front of it. And now my foot was wedged with my toe against the door and my heel against the threshold. So the door was going nowhere. It, would, it couldn't physically close. So he is repeatedly trying to get the door closed, trying to grab the security chain to get them together. And I just look at him and I say to him, you recognize me, don't you? And did you ever, did you think that I wouldn't come for you one day? And, and he's, he is panicking and shouting, go away, go away. That was his initial reaction. Go away, go away, trying to get the door closed. Looking at his expression then in those first moments, what was his face telling you? Hmm. I'll never forget it. Fear pure fear and panic pure oh my god he's here that that is it fear panic and oh my god he's actually here that's him and i'm thinking the same that's actually him and did that look confirm to you that he had it was definitely him. It definitely done it. And you could tell by the way he was looking at you, you know, he was bracing. Because you said to him, I've, did you think that I would never come for you? He might be thinking, all right, I did this. And now this, this guy's come to kill me. Yeah. So he was, he definitely had fear for his safety as well as fear that, that I had brought this back to his life. So the two different types, they're, actually they're quite different types of fear, right? physical fear for his safety for sure because I had one foot in his house and I wasn't moving <clears throat> but definite fear that I brought this back to his life and really if I could have videoed the exchange and we could put it in front of psychologists or body language people who are skilled in reading body language that would be enough evidence to say yeah this man is guilty and had you found out at this point, like whether you're still married to the same woman, well, what kind of a job he had, anything like that? So he's actually a nurse, um, and he wasn't uh, training to be a nurse when I was uh, at the time the abuse was going on. And um, he, so I knew a little bit about him, and I'd actually, yes, yeah, so so that, and I don't, I think this is his first wife for sure, and she was in the house as well. Was, did, um, they have, did they have their own kids in the house or anything like that? I don't know if their kids were in the house or not. Um, so what, what was his wife's reaction? She was shouting and screaming. She knows who I am because she was involved in the police investigation. So she knows exactly who I am. And of course, from the Facebook message I sent her, she knows what I look like. So she's also shouting, go away, go away. Now, the confrontation at the door lasts goes on for a number of minutes and I was just telling him everything that I wanted to say to him. So I would say things like, do you remember when you used to get me to X, Y, Z? And when I would say the X, Y, Z, the explicit moments, he would shout over me like in a panic, trying to drown out my voice because he, of course, of course he's doing that. And then within a minute or so, he, start, he shouts to his wife to call the police. So his wife calls the police. Now she's on the phone to the police. It sounds like chaos in the background. It must off. He's shouting, go away. The door is making a noise. I'm shouting. We're both trying to shout over each other. His wife's on the phone. But I just said to him, I, I just said to him, please call the police. <laughs> like, I'm annoyed that they're not involved anymore. So do me a favor and call the police. So we had this situation where I really felt powerful in that 
I felt in, I was completely in the driving seat. There was nothing for me to fear um, physically or in any other area. And, and I, I, was, I was in control here. So I was speaking to him like I am speaking to you now. I didn't need to raise my voice in an angry tone. I needed to raise the volume of my voice, but that was it. And he was saying to me, um, you're lying, you're making all of this up, you're looking to blackmail me for money, you want my money. And, and I just, I, I genuinely just smiled at him because he was clutching at straws. So um, did the police arrive then? So yeah, maybe. I reckon I was at the door for about three-ish minutes and I got to a stage where I was like, right, is there anything else I need to say to him? I had, all the, I had the time because the door was wedged open and um, I, 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 I was like, right, I've had nothing. I, I've said everything that I want to say. So I said to him, right, where are the police? He said, they're coming. So I said, I'll wait up the top of the drive. There was no point in me running away. That would, that would not look good or, or that would not be the correct decision for me to make. So I waited up the top of the drive three police cars come around the corner, blue lights, the whole works. And I called them in because I've got nothing, I've got nothing to hide or, or I've got no issue with being there. So I called them in. It was, in a, it was like a housing estate and they jumped out of their cars and they came for me. Um, three, four, five policemen, because in their eyes, from what they'd heard, uh, I was trying to break into the house. And I literally just, when they asked me what I was doing there, I just pointed at him to, towards the door. And I said, that's the man that abused me when I was a child and I've come to speak to him about it. And, and really it changed everything. Their body language changed, the vibe changed because that, that stopped them in their tracks in a way. And I was just like, look, here's the reason why I'm here. And um, that's it. How did they know you, were, you weren't a crazy person just making all that up? Could they verify that? They couldn't, of course, verify it at the time. But once they had taken the statements off me and his wife and him, they came to speak with me again and, and mentioned that they have to arrest me for a couple of charges, um, suspected charges. And they said to me, we're not going to handcuff you because we are happy with the way you are responding to us and behaving. So they could see that I wasn't lost my mind, a man in, 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 in a situation where he's lost his mind and acting irrationally. So you were arrested for what? So um, I may be corrected on this, but something along the lines of um, using violence to enter somebody's house um because of course his statement was very must have been uh he was playing the victim in this in this situation so he must have said stuff like he was trying to hurt me or or something so they arrested me for that so how long were you interacting with the police for before you were able to go home so wow well, i was arrested and taken to a station um and I was put in the cell for three or four hours, fingerprints taken. And when this was all going on, I was just shaking my head to myself when I was sitting in the cell, like my belt's taken, my shoelaces are taken. And I'm like, how have we ended up in this situation? But I was also saying to myself, that couldn't have gone better. Not the, not the fact I'd been arrested and put in a cell. I'm not saying that was a good thing in any way, but I found out where he lived. I managed to, he answered the door, not somebody else. He was at home. He didn't manage to slam the door in my face because I think I would have found that very difficult to deal with. I managed to hold it open. I got all the time I needed in front of him and he was forced to face me and what he had done. So in the cell, I was thinking, this is a rubbish situation, but everything happened okay. After four hours of being in the cell, I was interviewed by the police officer and put on bail for um, four weeks. 
and the bail conditions were that I was not allowed back to that area or to uh, communicate with him directly or indirectly. And of course, I adhered to those bail conditions. And um, then the final offences that they had come up with was assault on him for pushing the door into him and pushing him in the chest when he went to slam the door to, to keep the door open and stalking and harassment for the times I've tried to make contact with both him and his wife over the last 12 months. So. What's interesting is then you're at the police station and you had this overwhelming positive feeling that everything had gone well. Would you say that there was a psychological release? All this stuff that had been building up over the years, was it all of a sudden expelled a lot of it? Yeah, for sure. For sure. To, to let him know that I never forgot, to let him know um, he can't run away forever, felt very, felt, felt good. It felt good to do that. It felt good to confront him. Did you feel lighter? For sure. A similar feeling, actually. A similar feeling to the first time I ever told anybody. That weight off my shoulders, that that feeling of reward, achievement, strength, victory over this situation, over him. But it was like telling those other people was a rehearsal for this. So when it actually came down to the moment, you said the feeling was similar, but was it way more intense? Yes, for sure. Way more intense, for sure. Um, actually, I say that, we, actually, I, I, I want to correct myself there. Probably the same intensity because the first time I ever mentioned this to anybody out loud was the first time I had ever spoke out loud about it. Which was a huge deal. Which, which is a, which is an absolutely ginormous thing. Of course, to face him is equally as ginormous, but we're talking 10 years later than the original speaking out to my friend. So I've, I've spent 10 years, 10 years dealing with it, analysing it, getting used to it, doing things around the subject. So one is not more bigger than the other. They're all, they're all huge. Did you end up getting convicted of anything that you were charged with? So I was, um, I had to go to court and I pleaded not guilty to the charges. And now it's being deferred to trial. So um, the trial will be soon, uh, as soon as coronavirus has um, been handled, then there will be a trial date. Now, I'm, I'm happy that at the trial date, we will have to be there for questioning because he will have to be there for questioning because he's trying to press charges and so is she. So we're all going to have to stand in the same courtroom and and be questioned in front of the system again and that is okay with me it's not ideal it's not a good situation to be in i understand but i am going to stand in that courtroom and be very open about why i knocked on his front door in the first place when they ask me why did you go to his house which is a question they will ask me i am going to explain the truth do you think there's a chance that they know that might happen so they just won't show up in court and then the charges will be dropped? I don't... Um, uh, yes, I... I think there's a possibility of that. I don't know what the, the, the legal system is with regards to if you press charges against somebody, um, then you're summoned to court to give... Uh, to give everybody... All witnesses are summoned to court. So I don't know whether you can just get out of it. But also the... The, the situation is to his wife, who he has told this is all lies, why would he not turn up to court? Why would he not turn up to court and get this crazy man that turned up at his house that's making all these lies up? Why would we not press charges and get him restricting orders and everything? If he says to his wife, I, I, I don't want to uh, press the charges, she's going to find that very unusual. So I think he's in a very sticky position. What would be the best outcome for you? The best outcome for me would be no punishment, first of all. 
um, if I get punished for this, I will feel that is very unfair. It's very unfair. I was calm and collected and um, I behaved in a very sensible manner at the door. And um, I was there for a reason. I was there to have a discussion with a man. That was it, right? I was there to have a discussion with a man about what happened 25 years ago. So for me to be punished about for that, I will feel it's very unfair and will make me feel quite frustrated and angry. So the best result of this is to have the trial, to have the trial and bring this situation back to the attention of the system. But the best result is no punishment for me. You come across as a very good natured man with a generous spirit. So in court, would it, would it there be a jury? Would people actually be able to make a decision on this or would it just be in the hands of prosecutors and a judge? Yeah, I think because it's magistrate's court, I believe it's, it's like three judges and they make a decision. Okay. And what are you trying to achieve with your YouTube channel and speaking out about it? I just want to share my story and the way and, and how I feel about what happened. Um, and because I want to help break down the stigma and the silence that is allowing this whole thing to thrive. It is the stigma and the silence that's keeping it behind closed doors and, and it's there where it's thriving. And I feel that I should do my bit by sharing my story. And that is not, I'm not trying to say that every person that's been through this should tell their story. I'm just trying to do what's best for, for what I think is best for me. And I'm trying to share the story in the most engaging ways that I can. So I have done some, um, I've created the YouTube channel, I've created social media, the Facebook, the Twitter, the Instagram, and I'm posting, the posts that I'm creating are I've put some photography in there, some illustration in there. I've started working with people with it sh to do create short films. And um, I want to make it engaging, interesting, because actually I want people to watch it who have no link to this subject. Maybe just your, 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 your usual person um, scrolling through their news feed. They watch the opening 15 seconds of my video and then they're hooked and maybe they talk to somebody about it the next day. And that will open conversations and spread awareness and break down silence. You're a very brave man, Jeremy, and I respect your mission. I imagine a lot of people that this kind of thing happens to, they, they bottle it up and, uh, you know, they, they hold it inside themselves and they, they don't share it with other people for various reasons. So I'm going to urge people to support your mission by going down in the description box and clicking over and subscribing to your YouTube channel and, and going on your socials. Is there anything you would like to say in conclusion to people watching this video? To anybody who has been through something similar that's watching, something that I always repeat to myself is, it's okay, it's going to be okay. And you are stronger than it. So if anybody's watching, if anybody's watching, yeah, let's, let's really, let's really use us, let's really squeeze some good out of our stories and, um, and, and try to, 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 to raise awareness for this subject. It's very important. I guarantee there's a lot of people watching this now and some of them are still holding it in and they're taking drugs and alcohol to deal with that pain and you know they're doing themselves in mm. it's just it's just um so horrible a lot of some of the people i've interviewed of have, have, um one of the guys he kept getting out of prison and going to his abuser's house and he was he was going to try and kill him mm. and uh, they put him back in prison and then he'd get out and the first day he got out, he would go back to that guy's house again. And it was just to see the absolute chain of destruction this causes in the person's life. So sad. It is really sad. So if people are out there, um, perhaps they can reach out to you sure. on your socials. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, maybe you can inspire them um, to do something more positive than... Yeah falling back on drugs and alcohol, yeah. which, which I've just seen so many people doing. It's, yeah. it's uh, self-medicating. It's really, it's really tragic. 
All right, well, thank you for coming on, Jeremy. Thank you. Cheers. You take care and good luck with what happens next with it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. I really You're appreciate welcome. it. Cheers. All the best.